I'm going to go live on Facebook just with my uh, my regular camera with its mics and then um, we've got another one that's got better audio on it so I'll get rolling there and then uh, and then uh, now just so I'm clear um, Stronger Advice is your new book right? Strong advice, yeah. Strong advice, yeah. Okay, I got strong stronger. Advice, yeah. I just strong. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have a new book in the making that I wasn't aware of yet. So uh, uh, I might, but uh, <laughs> that could be good. So uh, yeah, we'll just play it by ear, man. I know you're uh, good at talking. I've watched a few of your interviews now. Uh, it was so so oh, man. I'm so happy to see you on uh, Ruben. And okay. happy to see Shapiro picking you up. I'm a I'm a lefty man. I'm a former, um, almost a ten time Green Party candidate here in Ontario. Okay. Uh, Ontario. I don't know if you know where I'm at, but I'm across the lake from Toronto, uh, right near Niagara Falls. I'm in a town ca called St. Catharines. We're right on the south shore of Lake Ontario. Um, I got red pilled. I don't know how it happened, man, but I am. Oh, yeah. I'm just so. Um, I'm surprised that it was so painful coming off my beliefs. You know, I was mm. pro-choice, I was pro-capital punishment, and I've maybe not reversed my opinion on everything, but, I, you know, this... When, 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 did that, when did that all happen? Uh, I think it happened slowly, but it start, I think Peterson triggered it with uh, seeing how the left was reacting to him and uh, these trans activists... Um, do you, do you want to do you want to do this as part of the podcast or is this? Yeah, yeah. You know what? We should probably should. Good ideas. I, I, I'm just wondering. I, it sounds like an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's get rolling here. And we are rolling there live with Zuby, brother. Thank you for the time, man. We are live now on Facebook. So, uh, you if you've got, uh, is there a way I can share it? Yeah, you can see it on Jim Fannin, um, my personal page. Let me just Let me make sure. If, there's, if, there's, if I can share it on mine, then I will. All right, beautiful. Appreciate it. And then uh, back to Skype. Where am I? Yeah, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to make sure that we're rolling here. And that's all I need is okay. a picture of you, so that's good. Um, and so wh where on Facebook do I go to? Yeah, just check uh, Jim Fannin. It should be uh, maybe a link on the Jim Fannin show too, but at Jim Fannin should come up. Facebook.com slash Jim Fannin. You should see it there. Okay. It should be public too, so I don't think we have to be connected for you to see it. I'm a fan of your page though, and I subscribe today to the YouTube channel, put myself on notifications, waiting for some new stuff to come out. Nice one, man. Thank you. Are you seeing it now? Uh, uh, I see the announcement on your main page. Let me just check. All right. Okay, cool. I will Let's see if I can share this here. <laughs> Forgot I had the tape over my camera. I'm that afra <laughs> I'm that afraid of Big Brother. <laughs> And I don't even sit naked in front of my computer often. <laughs> <laughs> I heard Gavin McInnes the other day on his podcast. He's like, he was talking about the effects of caffeine on his um, sexual parts. And he was sitting naked while he was recording the show. And I'm on my walk. <laughs> and I'm, tr <laughs> I'm walking down the street in the North End over here. And I'm just killing myself laughing. I can't even believe he's talking about this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. I'm, I'm going to share it on my on my page and also right. my personal profile, cool, so I'm man. sure a few. I appreciate it. I'm sure a couple of Zuby fans who are milling around will. Yeah, tweet. well, I already getting all kinds of action on the last tweet that you sent out, so I appreciate that. Um, I know you're well. You you were a small guy, not even that long ago, but uh, it's weird how the social media can make you uh, internet famous almost immediately. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> so I really have been watching your growth. It's been really cool. Uh, so when, when did you when did you start following me? Uh, good question. Um, I can't remember whose show it was that you got exposure on or how, maybe it was the trans left or deadlift. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was for a lot of people. It hasn't been a long time. So, anyway, Zuby is my guest. Follow him at Zuby Music on Twitter. Firstly, guy's a stud. Look at him. Uh, you can't see him now, but you'll see it later. Uh, fiercely handsome. Oxford educated, a British rapper, podcast host of the program Real Talk with Zuby. He's an author, motivational fitness and training coach, and self declared free thinker. Love that. And inspiration for millions. His new book, Strong Advice and Album uh, Perseverance, the best of Zuby, are available now and uh, everywhere. So, welcome, Zuby, to the show, man. First, uh, I, I just want to say thank you for the time. I know uh, you've got a lot of uh, pub lately. We were just talking about, you know, how. You know, social media can make you an internet star almost overnight. I know we can talk about how that happened. Uh, but yeah, if you could, I know you've probably done this a few times, but just for my listeners and, and people that are watching the show now, try to go back to the beginning, a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got to where you are, just a, a good solid primer in the background of who Zuby is. Yeah, no problem at all, man. Um, so I'm Zuby. I'm a full-time independent professional rapper. Um, I have achieved quite a lot completely independently, including selling over 25,000 albums around the UK. I've performed in eight different countries, reached, uh, had my videos viewed online over 5 million times, uh, got over 120,000 followers across social media, and opened up for a few well-known artists, including Tech 9 Akala, The Far Side. And um, yeah, I also run a podcast called Real Talk with Zuby, which comes out every Friday. I talk to a whole bunch of interesting guests on there. Had guys like uh, Gad Sad, Dave Rubin, uh, lots of other well-known people on there and lots more to come. And I've also recently become an author after releasing my first book, which is a fitness ebook called Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. That just came out in May. So yeah, got a whole bunch of uh, strings in the bow. I also do some public speaking, some coaching, a whole bunch of stuff, man. I'm trying to do everything. <laughs> cool, man. So uh, tell us about how you got started and your claim to fame here as far as the early days. I know we'll talk about uh, your mm. deadlift record uh, coming up, but uh, how, how has this progressed, how slowly, and maybe some tips on others that are you know, considering dipping their toe in the podcast pool or, or the ebook pool or what have you? Yeah. Okay, well, the podcast and ebook, those are brand new for 2019. I just started my podcast in mid January. I've done uh, over 40 episodes so far. That's actually going to be, uh, there's a local radio station here where I live in Southampton, UK, that's actually picking it up. And it's going to start broadcasting on their station uh, in a couple weeks' time, nice. which is really cool. So it's a lot on radio man, as well. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the book, also, that was a one month turnaround. So those two things really? are like things that I, yeah, I wrote the whole book in uh, about two weeks. Wow. So, I was not necessarily planning on becoming a podcaster or an, well, podcaster, podcasting I'd been thinking about for a while. So right. I knew that was coming. The book, though, that came more on a whim. And I was like, you know what, why don't I do this? I sat down, blocked out a week and just sat down and did it. Um, in terms of everything else, though, going back, going, going back to the core of what I do, of course, being a rapper, being a musician. So I, um, I studied computer science at Oxford University. And when I was there in my very first year, I started rapping just for fun. I actually got stuck in an airport one time when I was traveling and I had a 24 hour layover in Paris and I had not didn't have much to do. I just had um, my MP3 player with me, so a pen and some paper, and I just started writing down some rhymes. I've been a hip hop fan for since my teenage years. So I I guess I'd rapped before, but always rapping other people's stuff. This was my very first time ever putting pen to paper and writing my own stuff. And I picked it up fairly quickly. Um, fast forwarding a little bit when I was in my second year of university, after I'd been rapping for about nine or 10 months, I actually released my very first album. So I put out my first album when I was in university, it was called commercial underground. And that had a song on there called step into me, which was my very first single and my first music video, which got a lot of love. They played it on the BBC radio in Oxford, BBC introducing supported it. Um, the music video got played on national TV the video was uh, shot, in, shot in the university as well, so it was a little bit different. I think it was probably the first rap video shot at Oxford University. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so it was a little bit different. It was kind of my USP. It was like, okay, this guy's in Oxford, and also he's rapping. That's a little bit different. So I finished university. I got my degree. I did one year. I did my music full time, and then I actually moved to London to go and work in the corporate world. So I was a consultant. I worked for um, a management consultancy company for several years for three years in total. And then in 
late 2011. Wow, that's a while ago now. Yeah. I uh, took the plunge. I jumped out and I went to doing my music full time and just hit the streets and started grinding, really, man. Just started putting out my albums, putting out my CDs, just going traveling all over the country and selling them, doing gigs in different places, organizing my own tours. A lot of that stuff, you know, I, I still do to this day. I mean, I'm still independent. So everything I've done, everything I've established so far, a lot of times people think I've got some manager or agency or some publicity behind me or anything. But no, it's all genuinely been done off my own back. I design my own merchandise for the most part. I design my own album covers. Um, I do most of the stuff like I'm a true DIY artist with the exception of making beats. I'm not a producer. I work with different people on the beats. But pretty much everything else down to my websites, I really? built you, and created man. all that stuff myself. Self-made, that's awesome. And uh, tell us about your experience. You certainly don't come off as a victim in, in this victim culture of the left. <laughs> Everyone's a victim, intersectionality. I mean, if you're black and then you can go all the way down the, the list. Tell mm -hmm. us about your experience and you know, you're growing up. I know you, you were raised in, uh, you spent a decade in Saudi Arabia. You were born there, mm -hmm. I, I think. I wasn't born there. I was okay. born in the UK. Okay. Yeah, so Tell us about your experience, England. though, as, you know, from your perspective. Yeah, no problem at all, man. So um, my family background, my parents are originally from Nigeria, but I was born in the UK along with uh, my siblings. And um, we moved to Saudi Arabia um, when I was a baby. So I went, I went to preschool there. I went to school there. Um, it was like an international school slash American school. So that's why my accent to this day sounds like the way it does now. I've been in the UK on and off for 20 years. But you sound Canadian just, to me, brother. I sound Canadian. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, that's the one because I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of people here like a combination of American and English. So okay, yeah, well, that would work out think, to be Canadian almost, yeah, right? Yeah, a lot of people think that it's Canadian or, you know, it doesn't matter where people are from. Like, yeah, everyone thinks it's American or Canadian. Yeah, but, nice. um, so I was, so I grew up in Saudi Arabia for the most part. I did go to boarding school in the UK from a pretty young age, uh, from the age of about 11. So between 11 and all my time throughout university, I was back and forth between the two countries all the time. And so, um, yeah, so I was there and then moved to the UK permanently about 10 years ago. So I've lived in a few different cities here. I'm now based in Southampton. Before that, I was in Bournemouth. And before that, I was in London. Before that, I was in Bristol. So um, wow. I'm very well traveled. I've been to like 32 different countries, performed wow. in eight of them, and got a whole lot more to do. Nice. Uh, I, I want to touch on some of the guests that you've had on, and your, man, your channel is starting to grow well. Uh, it, it's tough, tough getting it to take. Eh? I mean, unless you get something to go viral like you, you did in what was it, February with the transgender uh, lifting, we'll talk about that. But, um, you know, for, you know, I saw Shapiro commenting on you. I know you were on Ruben's show. I think he's been on your show as well. Having Gad said, I mean, Gad said, it, you know, I know he call, <laughs> calls himself the sexiest man alive, and I got to give him Lebanese love all over that, man. I just love that <laughs> self deprecation and, you know, how he talks about what a great soccer star football star he is and uh i know you've had megan murphy on i had megan murphy okay. on still one of my my all-time uh um most listened to shows or viewed shows uh megan murphy uh, at that time was uh, and still has carried her prominence over um ashley st Clair. another here yeah. here we have a young independent thinker um, just happens to be a conservative and a trump supporter who's just getting murdered murdered on social media out there you know what i mean she's pretty blown, girl she's blown up there she's gained she's gained fifty thousand followers since i yeah. since i featured her on the show so. yeah and the things like, they say about her it's just incredible <laughs> and you know you, you got to be careful what you wish for because you know at one time you know i'm a former terrestrial radio guy um i had a couple different shows and um you know, you come out to the social media, and it, it's a different world because the interaction, right? And 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 you why you really got to have thick skin. And you know, I'm a student at Gary V's a little bit, and I, I think I heard you say, or, or even Crowder said the other day on his clothes for uh, Louder with Crowder on Thursday night. It's just do something. He struggles with uh, mental health issues. Just get out of bed and just do it, man. And uh, so I know you've had some help along the way as far as some viral help on social media. Uh, had some great guests, but what you know and i heard tim uh pool say the other day oh so you want to be a, a youtube star eh? well i've been working for two years doing mm -hmm. seven videos a day on three channels and mm -hmm. and six 16 hours a day 
You know, like, yeah. so you want to be a YouTube star? Here's how you do it. So you got to in anything, bro. I mean, I've been, I started, I released my first album in 2006. So to anybody who thinks like Zuby has just showed up in 2019, like, no, there's a whole, there's a whole catalog for you, yeah. which you can go and discover. I mean, if you look at all my social media accounts, all of them are more than 10 years old. The newest one is like eight years old. The right. oldest one is 15 years old. I've been on Facebook for 15 years. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, you can go on Twitter. Like I joined in 2009. So oh, the, man. yeah, a lot of people have discovered me, not just this year. I mean, I gained a lot of followers last year as well, just because I started, um, putting more of myself out there, putting more of my thoughts, my observations about the world and just things that go on in my mind. I started putting that out there more rather than kind of siloing off my personality and only putting out my music and my art. I decided to just become a bit more open with it because it seemed like, the world needs more rational voices. And I was like, okay, I talk about all this stuff in private with people, with my parents, with my siblings, my family, my friends. So why don't I start putting out some of these ideas or opinions on Twitter primarily? Like my other ones, I still, I don't know, I don't put out too much on there. I just think Twitter is a good platform for it because I can, I can write, you know, I can write, I can just talk, I can think out loud in short bursts. I don't need to put up a photo or worry about getting crushed by the Facebook algorithm. And it's a lot faster than YouTube too. So I found that, um, that's just been a great platform for me and it's my biggest platform. And, you know, the other ones are sizable, but I just think that Twitter in terms of a social network for all its flaws and for all its annoyances, I do think it's the best social network out there. Hmm. And so, uh, tell us about what put you, is this what put you over the edge with this, uh, this uh, video you took at the gym, which was absolutely hilarious brother like i mean that's what i love most about you is your well i i love your heart most because i think you know when you were saying you, you put a little bit more of yourself out there i'm saying in my mind are you just being honest and open as before where you couched i mean you can't i see you talking about abortion you're talking about some really heavy subjects out there yeah man, and I, lots of that I, stuff I, people tend to keep to themselves because they don't want the backlash yeah, but do you know do you know what it is that made me become more outspoken is the fact that I realized that people who held very opposing views, values, beliefs and ideas to me, many of which I think are destructive, they are very outspoken. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, someone needs to counter some of this narrative. I mean, you you touched on before the before we were really we were really rolling, you talked about uh, Jordan Peterson. You've already mentioned people like Gad Sad, Dave Rubin. You know, people who are known for being public figures who speak out and speak honestly and have conversations about some of the stuff going on in society. And that's important because you've got people who are pushing some crazy ideas, and all it takes for crazy ideas to completely infiltrate and perhaps even dominate society in the long term is for people not to say anything. And most people don't want to say anything. The moderate There's middle is silent for the most part. Yeah, ex exactly. But that's the majority of people. That's mm -hmm. the thing. So you can hear this fringe and that fringe. The extremes. And that fringe. And that fringe. Those, they, they tend to be, people who are more radical tend to be more outspoken. Right. So they'll be there like, you know, pushing their crazy ideas. And that's mm -hmm. why they've got the freedom of speech to do, to do that. I'm not trying to deplatform or shut anybody down. Right. But if someone is saying this on that side, it's like, okay, well, what about, what about this side? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, that other side, I wasn't hearing, I was, you know, there were a couple of voices out there, but I was like, okay, I need to, I need to start putting some of my thoughts out there. And one, one thing that's really interesting is I feel like I, um, I mean, I guess everyone thinks that their position and their opinions make sense, but like, <laughs> so this seems like almost like a moot point, but I do genuinely feel like on most things I have an opinion on, my opinion is very like reasonable and well thought out and backed by logical thought and research and thinking and stuff. It's science? Like something I heard from some, yeah, well, yeah, so, yeah, science where science is relevant. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's some places where not everything is scientific. Sure. Some stuff is just like, okay, just an idea or a philosophy. Morality. Or a way of yep. doing the world or morality or something. Yeah, some of those things are hard to, you know, science is very useful and science is very valuable, but mm -hmm. science doesn't answer everything science doesn't tell you how to run a country or how to run a family or how to run yourself right or science have faith yeah no yeah. oh or you know what's the point of us being here like science yeah. doesn't 
science can't answer that. It can tell me how my food digests and why I'm stuck to the ground when I, mm. you know, and why <laughs> when I jump, I fall back down. I, it can explain all that, but it can't tell me anything on a different plane, right. um, which is where, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian myself and I'm, I'm very, I'm very open and honest about that. You know, I'm, I'm a believer in God, but I think whether or not people believe in God or any traditional religion, it's very, it seems almost inevitable that all human beings search for meaning. And I think once you're really searching for that, most people understand that science itself isn't going to, doesn't have all the answers. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't, science doesn't explain the whole human condition, if you want to call it that, right, or your, right. your own personal situation. Um, it, that's not really what it's for. So what I find is, you know, even amongst people who don't believe in, uh, you know, people who are atheists or even anti-theists or who don't follow any specific religion, they still crave, inevitably crave some kind of higher purpose, purpose or meaning yeah. or, or ideology or mm -hmm. some kind of explanation, you know, otherwise it is just like, okay, we're just animals on a big spinning rock hurtling through space, like spinning around the sun, spinning around a giant star. And that's okay. <laughs> but it's like, all right, so how do we treat each other? How do we treat ourselves? What's the point? Like I've got, we've got between 70 and a hundred years. Like, what do we, what do we do with them? Yeah. Like, are we meant to, yeah, you know, so there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, it doesn't answer. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, however people find an answer to that, as long as it's not destructive and harmful to other people, I'm cool with, like, I don't care about, um, you know, I'm not someone who tries to like push my beliefs on anything on mm -hmm. other people. If someone wants to know my opinion or, or my view, I'm very happy to explain it. If they disagree with me and they want to have that discussion or debate, I'm cool with that. You know, I've, I like talking to people of all different belief systems and ideas, you know, as long as people are cool and respectful, then I'll talk to, I'll talk to anybody, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't like being stuck in an echo chamber. I like to understand the world around me. I want to know how other people tick. If there's, if there's something that I believe, and someone else has like the polar opposite opinion. My thing isn't like, oh, I want to like escape from that person or like it's, it's actually like, oh, I'll, OK, that's a discussion I want to have. Yeah, yeah. Because I think most people do have good intentions. Right. And most people's beliefs. I mean, I think a lot of people's beliefs kind of come from other people and they just adopt them and they sure. don't really think about them. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, that's even more important to have those discussions because there are so many people like people say, um, Especially online, people are like, oh, don't bother discussing or debating with people online and you can't change. I'm like, dude, I've changed a lot of people's minds just on Twitter. And I know that. Really? Yeah. Like, yeah, I've changed a so lot. Because so many people say, oh, you're never going to change anybody's opinion. Yeah, name. no, I, I get DMs from people who are like, yeah, man, like I just, you know, read that thread you were saying or followed this discussion you were having and you've made me like think about that whole issue differently. That's gratifying, never, eh? Yeah, yeah, you know, because they're, you know, they're so, oh, I've, you know, I've just never thought of it that way. And I think that's what it is. A lot of people don't think about things thoroughly. Like with myself personally, anything I have a strong opinion on, I only have a strong opinion on it because I've really, really thought about it from different angles and listened to both sides or different sides of the argument and approached it in different ways. And as a result, I've now come to this position, which can, which can still potentially change. You know what I mean? Sure, like nothing yeah. is necessarily completely set in stone hundred mm. percent, but they, you know, there are a couple of big issues, which I have changed my mind on over the years. And that's been from having these discussions and hearing the different arguments and kind of processing that myself. Um, but there's as opinionated as I am, there's most things I don't have a strong opinion on. Right. You know, like I, I there's a, <laughs> most things I don't know. If someone asked me about, I don't know, the Israeli Palestine conflict. Oh yeah. Like, you yeah. Know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion. I've, I've listened to both sides. Both sides seem to have fair points and fair mm -hmm. grievances, but I don't, I don't know enough about the history and sure. all the ins and outs. And, you know, that's like a whole field of study. So I'm like, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go on Twitter or Facebook or whatever and put out some big yeah. <laughs> spiel because I'll, I'll end up looking stupid because there'll yeah. be thousands of people who understand it better than I do. Sure. Whereas on other issues, it's like, okay, cool. I can put this out there and I can, argue you know i can argue my position or i can sure. explain why how i've come to this conclusion whether or not you know whether or not people agree that's fine but this is my own thought now i appreciate your your thoughts on that and uh you know your christianity i'm christian i was raised a christian you know i remember when i was old enough but young enough still to make up my mind and say you know what i'm hedging my bets dude 
if I get up there and all it took was for me to believe and I find <laughs> out that I got to go downstairs instead of upstairs because I didn't believe, the least I can do is while I'm on this filthy planet is believe. Okay, no problem. So it was all, it was all self-preservation, I'm telling you. Um, and, you know, the other, you know, I don't pray or read the Bible as much as I should. I'm really involved at my church because I call it Rock and Roll Pretty Church. It's like they've got some really good resources. It's like the first half is like a rock and roll show. I can see how that moves people. It's a Pentecostal, I think. So, you know, but I grew up Catholic. I was a confirmed Catholic, and I struggle with it all day. And like I said, I don't pray as much as I should. I pray when I'm down on my knees, when I'm broken, when I'm when, when I'm when when there's no nothing left. I turn to God, right? And I've just only learned to say thank you for the blessings, not where are you? Uh, the you know months ago, I remember telling my men's group, I prayed the other day. I was like, God, if you're there. <gasps> Oh, what the, what do you mean, God, if you're there? Like, I mean, that's not a faithful man. You know what I mean? So I, I really struggle with it. Um, but it's been there my whole life. And, and some of it was conscious and some of it wasn't. But I appreciate your thoughts on godlessness. I mean, maybe it's because my 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 faith is strengthened that, I, that I'm a little bit more out there on the front lines being attacked for my belief. You know, okay. I, I, there's a couple arguments you know, one is it's not a baby until it comes out of the womb. I, I, I can, we can't even discuss that after. It's just a clump of cells. I can't have an educated debate with you. And the other thing is, oh, there's no God. You, you believe in some silly man in the sky. Okay, well, you know what? If you're going to crush on me for that. so. But I appreciate your, your position, your observations on how this godlessness, you know, the, you know, Nietzsche was it said we killed God is dead. Well, I know that he wasn't celebrating that when he said God is dead. Uh, he was lamenting it, and, and he, mm -hmm. he was worried about, you know, the foundations of uh, Western civilization being cut out from underneath us because the bedrock was Christianity and God. Yeah. And the other thing, and I know you probably, this isn't a, you know, the fatherlessness in the States. Mm -hmm. You know, these are two things where I think have spectacularly impacted society today, especially in the States, you know, fatherlessness. You know, I love this uh, program Robert Bly put out. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called The Gathering of Men. And he really talks about the lack of elders that men have today. So what? Now they're mentored by gangs, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate your thoughts on, on both godlessness and, and fatherlessness as we move away from what it seems like uh, a more religious society and one that has real strong role models in the house. That's a, well, that's a, that's a lot right there, man. That's, that's, that's why heavy. they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that's heavy, man. Um, okay, so I'll start with, um, I, well, it's, I guess, tackling both of them to begin with. I think that what's weird is um, in, the, in the modern Western world, obviously, we live in a very, very hyper, you know, fairly hyper-liberal society now, certainly in the Anglosphere. So, you know, UK, Canada... Australia, Western Europe, UK. Uh, so, and that's and that's got some good things, you know. In terms of like my general views, I'm I'm fair. I'm very, I'm very libertarian minded. Okay. In that, I don't think people should. I don't like the idea of forcing people to do stuff. Really, want to um, keep the state out of your bedroom. Not harming it beyond not harming each other and right. not taking each other's stuff and not killing each other. I'm generally of the belief I, I'm, I'm generally nervous about putting restrictions from a top down perspective um, on what people can and cannot do. Not because I think that people should do everything like very, very, very far from it. Like I'm pretty socially conservative. I don't even drink. I don't, I've never smoked. I've never taken drugs, anything like that. I don't even have any tattoos or anything like that. It's just not for me. But I at the same time, if somebody wants to do those things provided they're doing it on their own volition and they're not harming other people in the process and they're old enough to consent, you know, as far as legally concerned, like, of course, like have at it, like do, do what you want. Um, but I think that what's weird is that we've lost a lot of, I say we talking about the modern Western world. I think that people are forgetting the roots and the foundations. And I think there's this almost, I don't know if I'd call it arrogance or complacency that you can kind of just completely tear out the roots from the tree and people are expecting the tree to stay standing. 
And I think that goes for both religion, and a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that one. Some people are going to hear that and be like, oh, no, 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 we want to get rid of, you know, we want secularism. I think, you know, religion and then family, you know, I think those things are kind of the bedrock. So I think liberalism is great in terms of prioritizing the individual and having a individualistic outlook, but you want to, it's, it's a tricky balance because you don't want like collectivism, which is, you know, like obviously people, have, you know, some people push political and whatever collectivism and I'm, I'm not for that, but from a societal natural perspective, you know, we are not atomized units. So as far as like laws and politics and stuff go, I think it's, yeah, treat people as individuals, judge people as individuals, rate people on their own merits and character and stuff like that, not on their skin color or their, or their gender or their sexuality or anything like that. Like, no, that that's, and any collective ideology in that sense is bad. But at the same time, you also want to foster shared value, shared values in community. So it's like, yeah, we're all individuals and you want to treat everybody as individuals, but you don't want to get so individualistic and atomized that people just become completely selfish and nobody cares about their neighbor or their family or their children or somebody, you know, it's uh, so it's kind of like, I don't know the right, Nihilism I don't know the right word in. for it. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a balance there. And I think that, yeah, I just think the Western world has kind of become so, um, it's just getting a bit lost, right? I think almost like as a, perhaps as a result of its own success, mm. um, kind of people have gotten a little bit, I don't know, fat and lazy and silly in terms of understanding what it was that kind of led to that. So when you, for example, so talk, talking about like fatherless fatherlessness specifically, right? You'll hear some people saying like, you know, you'll see articles come out in blogs or on newspapers, opinion pieces saying, hmm, are fathers really necessary? You know, oh. Some feminist will write a piece. Do we still really need men? You know, these, these kind of, these kind of people. They other, forget how they got pregnant, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, but you're also <laughs> just kind of thinking of like, you know, it's, it's almost like this thought of like, okay, look, we've built society up to this point. Things are currently peaceful right now. It's nice. Oh, we don't need men anymore, right? We don't need to, we don't need to defend you know, we, oh, we don't need We don't need police. We don't need soldiers. We don't need men to build things. We don't need builders. We don't need carpenters. It's like you're kind of just throwing away. It's, it's like you almost want to throw away this whole thing. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's fine to raise a, you know, oh, being a single mother is completely fine. You know, that's ideal. In fact, that might even be better than having a man around. And <laughs> it's just like you're losing. It's like people are just losing track of what it was that kind of got people to the stage and also what is the best thing generally for a society. Well, it's worked for so, so long. It's a reason that it's traditional, you know? Yeah. And there's a, there's a reason it takes a man and a woman to make a baby. I don't think that's an, whether someone believes in evolution or God or both, like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's like an accident that it takes <laughs> both parents and males. You know, if you look at the strengths and weaknesses of men, in general, and you take the strengths Careful. and weaknesses of women yeah. in general, right? Yeah. They compensate for each other. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you take if you take a man and you take take a woman, you take a husband and wife and you put them together, father and mother, they're you, better you, at different now, things. Yeah, you, yin and yang, right? The the father's mm -hmm. job is not going to be exactly the same thing as the mother's no. job. And again, you've got this idea of oh, boys should be more like girls, or men should be more like women, or women should be more like. And it's like no, stop, like. No, like, stop. <laughs> I'm just like, stop. Like, this doesn't mean, like, you need to, like, enforce, you know, some, yeah. like, fascistic gender roles on people. You're just saying, like, look, like, there's something that, you know, we've got different personality types and different strengths and weaknesses. So let the men be men. Let the women be women. Yeah, put them together. Lo and behold, look, society balances out. And things, know. things work. You don't need to force women into things that they don't want to be doing. Mm. You don't need to force men into things they, they don't want to be doing. It's like let people, you know, make these decisions and do what they want. And oh yeah, and just remember what actually works and what's if you're talking about children, what's good for the child? Like what's what do you what's what's a better situation? A child having one parent or a child having, you know, either just a father or just a mother or having both. Mm -hmm. Right? Ninety five percent of the time, like of course you get exceptions where, you know, sure. one parent is super crazy or abusive or whatever, but in ninety five percent of cases, all other things being equal. It's better to have both economically, Absolutely. socially, in terms of raising, in terms of discipline. Like this is not 
Mm-hmm. This is not rocket science. I don't need to. Someone will go. Someone will be like, "Oh, what's your study?" For? I'm like, "I don't need a study, right? The study is just like." Well, that's the, that's the same. That's the same exactly. arrogant that if you don't have a uterus, you have no say on abortion. Like, I mean, well, is there men's so. issues that we're excluding women from? I don't think so. You know, like no. Well, by that notion, you know, women should have no say in war or anything that really Draft, involves conflict yeah. because they're generally not the ones on the front lines for it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we live in a society like anyone can have an opinion on anything Mm. in certain instances you might have someone whose opinion might be more valid because they've like you know experience experience, where they live in a certain place or whatever Mm -hmm. but with most issues it's like you know it's not really it's not really like that um moving on a little so coming to the idea of like godlessness um that this is this is a tricky one and it's something that i you know I, i know i'm i'm friends with plenty of people who don't believe in god and we have some really interesting discussions yeah me too and my my thought is kind of I think atheism works for individuals. I think it can work well for individuals. For an entire society or country, I am not convinced. Certainly not in in the long term. In the short term, I think it could work. But I think in the long term, I think two things happen. I think one is that, again, it's, it's this idea of a tree losing its root because if it's if if it just becomes like okay human beings are god or the government is god or whatever and there's no higher power or higher authority then morality very rapidly can become totally subjective right you hear a lot of people these days talking about morality being subjective which is partially true i think but you mean like also- a uh, like a construct of society almost Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the idea that, that, you know, there's no set morality. OK. Right. So in my in my world, killing an innocent person is wrong, period. Mm-hmm. OK. But if you live in a world of subjective morality, mm, depending, sometimes killing if he's an a mass innocent murderer, person then be. maybe it's OK. Yeah. Well, well, no, that's not that's not even that because that's not an innocent person. There you go. What I mean. Perfect. Right. Yeah, so well, I, I so. Have. You know, the death penalty that that can be that can be discussed, but I that's right. that's in a separate category. Okay, so an innocent an innocent person, an okay. innocent child, an innocent adult, whatever. To me, in my worldview, in my morality, that is just objectively wrong, untouchable, flat. Like, yeah, they more mm-hmm. like it's not. Yeah, it's just it's just wrong. Okay, um, in my worldview, cheating on your husband or wife or spouse is morally like. Unacceptable, yeah. Yeah, it's unacceptable, right? Um, But in a world of subjective morality, especially if you're quite intelligent and intellectual, you can kind of justify anything. Mm -hmm. You you know what I mean? So stuff that people view morally reprehensible. So for I I don't know, like an easy example would be like, okay, cheating on a cheating someone cheating on their boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife. Like, what if they didn't find out? Then what is what's why is why is it immoral? Right. Someone could easily justify and say, well, it's moral because it didn't harm anybody, which is true. It didn't didn't nobody got physically harmed um, as long as the sex someone else had was, you know, was consensual. Nobody got harmed, um, didn't affect anybody's emotions because nobody found out. So, you know, it becomes very easy to, you know, someone could do that and then be like, well, why is why is it wrong? Who is to say it's wrong? Who's the authority to say this thing is wrong? Um and then you have other ideas. I mean, you know, and then it, it can get murkier than that. So, like I said, you know, coming back to things like killing other human beings, um, you know, it can be it can, you can. It, this is what happened in like Nazi Germany and some of the <sighs> communist regimes and stuff. Right. It became like, well, what if it's for the, the greater good in somebody's mind? So somebody could think, oh, OK, what if we. um Oh, you know, someone could think, oh, well, what if we just, you know, killed all the homeless people? Right. That would make that would make society better in some measures. Right. Someone someone could actually argue that, Mm -hmm. you know, and they could they could, you know, and they they could look at certain stats and do certain things. that could be, oh, look, there there'd be no more homeless people. You know, the (sighs) the population would decrease. There'd be less pollution. There'd be lower. lower. I mean, you you see this. I mean, because you see people saying like, oh, it's good to, you know. Some people's argument for abortion is like, oh, it's good because the world is overpopulated. And <laughs> people are, We're people a cancer are on the planet. Yeah. So I'm like, right. I'm like, that's, that's like Thanos, right? 
Have you seen Infinity War? That's literally like Thanos' morality. Okay. Okay, well, he just wants to wipe out half of the universe's population because there's too much strain on resources. Okay. So the whole reason he's getting all the Infinity Stones is so that he can kill half of the entire universe's population so that there's less strain on resources. And I'm like, that's his morality, right? Which in his worldview, like, makes sense, like, from a completely Mm -hmm. rational scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. But from a moral one, it's like, ooh, like... Right. So he just, so I don't know. I, I think, um, so with all that said, I think that the, the problem with, um, I guess, complete godlessness in, in a society is I think that over time, morality just slips, it, it slips into, like, because what are the fundamentals? What's it based on? Hmm. Is it based on feelings? Is it based on, you know? And again, if you take that approach, most people who would take that approach will be you know, have also have the view that human beings are just essentially animals, right? You're just advanced animals. And we know that most animals don't really have proper morality, do they? Mm -hmm. Right. So human beings are not, we don't hold human beings to the same standard as we hold dogs or beetles or birds, right? Mm -hmm. Birds will do, crabs will birth, crabs will birth their children and then immediately start eating their children if they're hungry, right? If a human being did that, we'd be like, you know, right? So, hey, we haven't done you know, that for yeah. <laughs> at least 100 years. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, human beings are held to a different standard. And, um, yeah. you know, a religious person would say, yeah, human beings are created in the image of God. And so we're not just animals. We are like super special in that regard. But not everybody believes in that. So it's like, OK, well, if we're just animals, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a straight I'm a I'm a straight young man, my animalistic urge might be to run around and impregnate, impregnate as many viable females as possible to pass on my genetics. Mm. But like that could get, you know, that could get dodgy really quickly mm. if I just go full animal mode. You see what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, so there's that, there's that. And then on the second one, which is a little more, um, might sound a little more controversial, but I also just think that a godless society in the long term will be conquered by one that is not. That's also what I think. Um, because unless you're going to snap your fingers and get rid of all the religion in the entire world from seven and a half billion people at once, um, I think those who maintain that cohesion and that belief will, in the long term, essentially overpower and or just outbreed those who don't. That's so you think total, like this total, totalitarianism is, sets in then in the absence of God? I'm just thinking while we're talking here, I mean, hmm. w- humans have believed in some type of higher power, some God Something. for almost ever. It's not yeah, like, you I, know, Jesus and Mary are a new story. There were d- other gods before them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, human beings believe want to believe in something. And I mean, mm-hmm. If you again, if you look in, the, if you look back at the 20th century, and you look at the totalitarian regimes, so like the Nazi regime, the communist regime in different countries, one of the first things they do is they root out religion, right? And that's not that's not accidental, mm. because human beings need to believe in something as a individual, maybe not always as individuals, but as a community, people want a higher purpose, mm-hmm. right? I have a theory that this links to the whole like. SJW collective weird intersectional movements as well, because I've noticed that people who are religious seem to be quite immune to that virus, which is interesting. And so I don't know if that's something you've observed, right? You don't, you won't find it. Yeah, I put it in a different context, almost like you look at the, the, the black population in the States are deeply, deeply religious. And going back to, you know, what I said earlier, it's almost like when you're on your knees and you're fucking broken, like, I mean... I, I think that that might have something to do with the, the the amount of faith because, man, they had almost nothing else other than the, their belief in God, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just think human – there's something in individuals. Like people want to believe in something. It can be a religion. It can be an ideology. It can be a diet, right? Just well, like, this is yeah. what so many people I find now – are religious about veganism. Mm-hmm. They're religious about yeah. abortion. They're religious about atheism. Like mm-hmm. that is their religion. They don't even get that that's their ideology, but they live it as a religion. And, you know, I, I like Peterson's uh, 
when he takes a swat at this, and he certainly doesn't come out like he knows at all, especially when it comes to God, but th this idea that uh, um, your, your, ideolo your ideology can be your religion. And, oh, absolutely. You, know, you just adopt it. Absolutely. As such. I, I joke. I joke with people sometimes. Like, I, especially, especially online. Like, I've spoken to some people who are like, uh, like hardcore atheists, and I often joke with them. I'm like, dude, you're more religious than I am. Yeah, and you right? live by I, all the same right? standards <laughs> that we've had. You know, like, yeah, like sometimes I'll be like, you're, you're more like when I talk about my belief in God, I'm like, maybe you know, maybe not all or most religious people might be like this. I accept that I could be wrong. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right, it's 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 fake. It's the fake, other like, side that fights it tooth and nail when they have like they don't yeah, they're like, not any more sure than I someone, am. Someone will want me to provide like a, a written mathematical <laughs> proof of how Formula. I know God exists, and I'm yeah. like, I believe mm, that God exists. Awesome. Yeah. Right, I have faith that God exists. I could, I will put my I'll be the first to put my hands up. I'll be like, you know what, I could be wrong. I could I could be wrong. Like I don't. Right. I, I, if, someone, if someone wants to know why I believe in God, I can. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to explain that and have that conversation. Yeah. But I can't honestly, as someone who's like and tries to be an honest person, I cannot be like I know 100 percent certain that everything I believe is correct. And judge you, everyone else whatever. accordingly because no. of your beliefs. No, no, right? no. I'm like this is my belief. Mm -hmm. um, you're welcome to disagree with me. Other people are welcome to believe in different things. My belief is not going to lead me to harm anybody or discriminate against anybody or kill anybody i'm not gonna you know like if people start using religion for that reasons then that's certainly a problem mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I just find it weird sometimes when i get in conversations with people and they're like so overzealous like they're the ones who are talking with more certainty yeah than i am and i'm like i'm i'm just like which which is where where I start finding it funny, right? Or, yeah, well, especially when they forward. condescend, when they're looking down their nose at you like you're yeah. a freaking idiot, like they know better yeah, than yeah. you do. And you want to have this conversation. I like uh, how Rube and, and maybe even Crowder, their 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 tactic in debate is backing up until we agree. Yeah, and then let's let's take it small steps forward to find out where our beliefs fork in the road, and then maybe we can have some understanding of why that that happens and and uh yeah i appreciate your thoughts on that um not to you know put god at the bottom of the ladder here but uh i want to i want to move on to some especially the conversation like i i really i i feel like i know your heart I, I feel like i've watched and seen you perform enough that i can see that there's there's an underlying commitment you you're provocative don't get me wrong but provocative for the sake of this underlying commitment. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but talk to me a little bit about this, um, the left and the right. Uh, you know, I, I came up with this, this, and this is like two years ago. Uh, I think it was a self-created lie that I, I created for myself was that the left and right was further apart than they'd ever been. Mm -hmm. They hate each other more than they ever have. And, and you can put men and women in that same camp. And so I wanted to know, like, what's going on here? Why are we more politically divided? Why are we seem to, seemingly at each other's throats? And then I think it, it took, you know, I did this deep dive with Peterson, with the, the, the big five personality types. I think that oh, yeah. speaks a lot to who we are. I know you've spoken about that on other programs. This idea that, you know, we're, we're all different, right? <laughs> and, and we're born different. Like, we're, like, I didn't know this, that we're actually born liberal and conservative, like, yeah, it's very linked to personality. There is a little bit that's obviously that is a is a product of our environment and, mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff. Uh, but and then so I I came to the maybe the understanding that maybe my idea of it was off. And like you said, we're not any more divided, especially if you go back to times of war, c civil wars. We've had you know wars in our own country that the left and right is actually not for maybe we're further apart but we're not mm -hmm. deep we're not more deeply divided than we've ever been again and this, here's the proof because the moderate middle that say nothing is 95 97 percent of us we're in the middle we don't say anything yeah. i don't consider i might be in that group but that mm -hmm. the extremes are the ones that have the loudest voice now and they're actually convincing into telling fairly intelligent guys like me in the middle that they're the majority that they yeah. speak for society when really i mean if, if you go back and look at it you know evolution 
the fringe ideas that were radical and extreme, the, you know, the people that came up with these ideas were killed and persecuted. And then, and, and, you know, expectations change over time. Human sacrifice used to be something that was commonly accepted. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't do that anymore. We don't eat our own people. We don't, well, you know, this kind well, of stuff. We don't, we don't eat each other, but I don't, the human sacrifice one, I'd, I'd argue, is still, um, but that's a, that's a whole another kettle of fish. Yeah, at least it's not common anymore. But, you know, I just came from this idea that we're, we're more divided. And then I thought to myself, you know what, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just that the extremes now with the social media, the way it is to have this huge platform. Mm -hmm. And, and now I think with, you know, Trump's done a lot of things, uh, good and bad for society. I, I like the fact that everyone's political now. Everyone's talking about <laughs> politics. So if nothing else, Trump did something well, to, Trump, to Trump is in the Trump just landed in the UK right now. And <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was laughing. It's about going to meet the, the queen. That, I was laughing about the fact that people are protesting, and I just think it's. I'm just like, go be useful, man. Like, what's yeah. protesting Trump going to do for your life? Seriously? Yeah. So it's I just gonna... came to the conclusion that no, we're not further divided. No, we're not at each other's throats. So yeah, more than we ever been. It's, it's just the extremes that have a louder voice now. Both are true, you know. Um, I don't know about the. I don't know about Canada and the UK. In America, the Republicans and Democrats are more divided than they've been for about the past 50 year, years or so. And that's that's factual. That's factual. Um, so in terms of their actual position, Republicans haven't moved very much, but de Democrats have moved a lot further left. Oh, for sure. Um, there's actually some interesting data on this. Mm, and not I saw. just that. Yeah, not just that, but their feelings. Uh, like if it was something like if you went back to like 1980, even like most Democrats – didn't dis they didn't actively dislike most republicans and vice versa whereas now that's not true something like 70 percent i think of like democrats act actively dislike republicans and a majority of republicans actively dislike democrats where it, it didn't used to be like that in terms of why it's the case i mean i think it's um i think it's a few reasons i do think some of it is some of the stuff that we touched on earlier about loss of common values Right. And one of those common values, whether people like it or not or think it's better or not, one of those things is religion. Right. So that's one of those things. Like one one thing I love, you know, when I'm in my church, I mean, or any other church I go to if I'm visiting, it's like you've you've got like, you know, people talk a lot about diversity, diversity, yeah. diversity. It's like you you got genuine diversity in there. You you'll see people of all different colors, shapes, sizes. And that's a strength when you have a common belief. Yeah, exactly. But that, that, you know, the belief unites everybody. Right. And actually it's, I mean, it's a tricky one because I think here's one thing about human beings that I've really come to understand in the last few years is that human beings are naturally, naturally lean towards tribalism. I was going to ask you that. Do you right. think that hate comes really naturally? Like, I mean, I, I feel like I, we're I all taught to fear the stranger, different color, different sexual orientation. Yeah. We're just, you look at it and we're like, what? no, I'm not going to. Yeah. When I say tribalism, I don't I don't mean hate. I just mean that people are naturally tribal. So this could be I mean, you see it in sports. Sports are a great example, right? Because sports taps completely into people's natural tribalism. Mm. And you see you see how that tribalism plays out in sport. And I think sport is good because it's like it's a, it's a way to vent that tribalism without actually hurting or fighting each other. It's right. almost like a mini war, isn't it? Right. If you watch American yeah. football on the field, like, the play. Yeah, yeah definitely. Like and sometimes even in the stands. Yeah. Yeah, and what's interesting is the things that make you good at sport are the things that would have made you like a very good hunter, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like it's accurate, accurate throwing and dexterity, hitting yeah. and fighting Strength. and dexterity and agility and speed and endurance. It's basically like these are the people who would have been like apex hunters yeah. back in the day. So it's almost like society still kind of worships those people. It's just that rather than hunting, they might be really good at kicking a ball or throwing right. a ball or shooting it into a hoop. And, you know, they're they're big, they're tall. You know, these are... You know, these are people who would have been like the hunters and the warriors in the past. And so in that way, it's like we haven't really evolved much, if you see what I mean. Mm. And I don't think tribalism is inherently bad. Um, I think it's just that what's important is how wide, how big the tent is. Right. right? I think you want, to, you want to make the tent as big as possible. And inclusive as possible. Yes, and as inclusive as possible. Because if you don't, what seems to naturally happen is pe people fall back. To the into this stuff right it's like you know this whole identity politics stuff it's like people and and that's why i think you see it on both sides so if you go on the far right side of the spectrum and you've got people who are like pushing for like 
ethno-nationalism or separatism or, you know, like what's it, what's what I found really interesting over the last few years is the far right and the far left, like the true far right and far left there, there, I think they're a lot more similar than they'd like to believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause they both see the world through a very racial lens. They like, they see everything as groups rather than as individuals. Mm -hmm. So they see, so if you, whether you're looking at the far right or the far left, they're going to be, you're going to hear stuff about white people and Jews and black people and people of color and this and that. And it's like, they use the same words and they're kind of coming at it from slightly different angles, but they're still doing the same thing. They're looking at this conversation and they're like, this is a white man talking to a black man. Right. I look at this conversation. And I'm like, this dude, two dudes talking to each other. <laughs> See what I mean? Like I can, I can, well, you, you, you're assuming my, uh, <laughs> sexual identity. Zuby. That's I, yeah, not yeah, very nice. Doing that. Sorry. <laughs> part of my bigotry. Um, yeah, but you know, like, of course, like, you know, it doesn't mean other people are not aware of like what people look like. You sure. But it's not the, it's not the thing that you view the whole world through, right? You're not viewing the entire world through like, these are my people and these are other people or the, you know, and that's but what both people on the very far left and the people on the very far right do. And it's not, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. And I think both ideologies are destructive and do and have led to really, really bad results when people have actually tried to enforce these policies from top down, whether you're talking about slavery and Jim Crow, or you're talking about Nazi Germany, or you're talking about the Soviet Union and some of the stuff they did there, like any time, or even in, um, or even like in Africa, like the Rwandan genocide, right? That was, you know, and that was people who looked the same, right? Like that was people who looked the same, but again, they, they fell into that tribal thing of like, okay, where are the, uh, what was it? It was the Tutsis and Tuts, the other Sunnis and uh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see the same thing in some of the mm -hmm. is, is some that of the was religious countries, based, though, right? and that that's within the same religion, right? So, oh, same the vast religion. Majority, yeah. The vast majority of Islamic terrorism is Muslim on Muslim, right? But it's mm -hmm. Sunni versus Shia. Right. Or in in Northern Ireland, you had the whole Catholic and Protestant, right? You had you know bombing each other and all, and so, and that to me that that's like negative tribalism. That's just like, you know, you're you're both Christian. You're all Christians. <laughs> you're saying, okay, we're Roman Catholics and we're Protestants, so we're going to now fight across those lines. Whereas, actually, if you made the banner a little, if you went up one notch, yeah, you'd then see you're all Christians. inclusive. Yeah. If you go up a higher notch, you'll see you're all Irish. If you yeah. go up a higher notch, you'll see you're all human yeah, beings, yeah, yeah. right? You see? So it's like you can you can go further. And then, um, I mean, this is interesting. One of the guys I spoke to on my podcast, uh, Bobby, because um, he he uh, he spent some time in prison. And one thing he was telling me about is just, uh, and you see this in movies, but how racially divided prison is, right? So when people go to prison, they fall back into these like ethnic gangs. So you've got the black gangs, you've got the white gangs, you've got the uh, Latino gangs, and people just fall back into this completely racial tribal mode of being, mm -hmm. which they weren't really in on the outside. And Even you know, though they're like, unified with a with a you know, a common cause. They're all incarcerated. It's not much of a cause, but yeah. 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 So it's, too. it's weird. So I think that kind of recognizing the fact that this is a phenomenon that clearly seems to exist across the billions of human beings mm -hmm. and always seems to have, like you look at history, people have kind of been doing this forever. The groups, the groups that they split themselves by change, but it's been happening forever. And I think we, mm -hmm. we reached like a really nice stage where certainly in the Western world, it's like, I think people, you know, from, I want to say kind of from like the, maybe from like the mid to late 80s up until like the early 2010s, it's like things things hit a nice balance, I think. You know, things hit a nice balance. Like you weren't really hearing. It was like, you know, everyone, it seemed like 90, 98% of people recognized like, okay, let's, you know, we're all human beings. Like we've got some differences, but let's just get on with each other. And one thing I don't want, the reason I really, the main, biggest reason I really dislike identity politics and the current, wave of, you know, people talking about privilege and oppressors and white, white, uh, white guilt and white fragility and white man, this and straight white men, this, <coughs> you know, this whole demonization intersectionality. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah it's, you know, okay, cool. Like every, we've, we've been racist to everybody else. Let's be racist towards white people now. And it's acceptable because it's our turn. Be <laughs> you, you can't you can't be racist against white people. People say right, no. and I'm just like, dude, like you're doing the exact same thing that you've been moaning about forever, 
right? You're just, you've just inverted it. That's how so I feel just, about the, the guys that hate Trump so badly right now. I, I'm like, you don't <laughs> even see that you are being Trump right now, you idiots. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I saw. I saw that um, the London mayor, Sadiq Khan, had put out some uh, article in The Guardian about – and I, I was just like, dude, you're, he, was, he was complaining about divisiveness whilst being divisive. This is what always happens. Like the media will be like – Oh, you know, there's too much division in the USA. Blah, we're tired of division. Um, but what we really need to do is, like, you know, recognize that white men are the biggest threat to the country. And you're like, <laughs> sounds like CNN like, now. You're like, Dude, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to yourself. Thanks, Don <laughs> Lemon. <laughs> you're like, Idiot. That's like a legitimate sentence out of someone's mouth, and you're just like. Dude, like, how do you? What makes you think? How that, are you still employed? That's yeah. You're just, but you're just like, the hypocrisy just amazes me. I'm yeah, just like, and they can't even see it. It's just like, completely. I'm, I'm really, yeah. I mean, my worldview is very simple. I'm just like, love like, is the answer, baby. Dude, love. dude, I, I'm just like, I'm like a true equalist, like, like true, like tr to the to the core. I'm like, when people say like treat people as individuals, I like mean, I like really mean that, not. Like people say it as a platitude, but it's like, no, like, but so few people, like a lot of people aren't really doing it. Right. You'll, you'll get people talking about, oh, you know, we need to treat people with equality and uh, dignity. And, you know, we want to embrace diversity and embrace, you know, this and, that. and then those, that exact same person will then jump on Twitter and start, you know, attacking somebody for their skin color mm. or for the fact that they're a man or for the fact that they're straight. Or the fact that they're gay. And you're just like, dude, like, practice what you preach. Well, like, it's okay thought, because well, they're privileged. And we need to we need to yes. chop these people down <laughs> with all this privilege, man. This, that, that's the thing. I'm just like, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the things that people classify as making people privileged are so arbitrary and random, too. Right. So, right. So, as someone like myself, may, maybe I feel passionately about this because, like, I'm actually privileged. You consider yourself to be pretty privileged. Yeah, like I'm genuinely pretty privileged, right? So when I hear this idea of like, you know, if I'm with a group of other black people who have like a similar background to me or whatever, and I hear one of them like say something about like, you know, white privilege, and I'm like, dude, like we in this room are more privileged than like 98% of, you know, mm. the white people in this country, right? Like Almost everyone know, alive today is well, privileged yeah, and, yeah, or, let, let, by let, technology let and food and all that. If you go further than our own countries, mm -hmm. like I've never, I've never heard anybody who is not privileged talk about privilege in this way. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody who is not privileged make a big deal about somebody else's privilege. Right. All the people who espouse these ideas and who go along with this crazy, weird, intersectional religion. Are all doing of them it are on their iPhone. All of them are privileged. <laughs> Down with capitalism. Turn your thousand dollar phone. All of them are privileged. It's amazing. Right. If you go to if you go to parts of Africa, if you go to parts of Asia, if you go to South, no then one you'll is know there what like privilege talking is. about privilege, or right. if they are, they're specifically you know talking about someone who's like in the royal family or in the government or some something like that where they have some kind of nepotism. So like I'm just like look, all these ideas just need to get buried. Like I'm sick of them. Like I, there's there's nothing. Not, I don't think anything positive comes of them. Like I literally just think it's a pure destructive force it's not like it's like oh, okay well it's good for this and that i'm just like no the whole thing is crap like mm, it's just a bad good for it's you a bad idea do you know what i mean mm, like there's definitely. tell me what tell me what is good about intersectional identity politics like how is it good mm -hmm. what's what's good about it what's it bringing to society nothing mm -hmm. literally nothing um you could have said that there was a time you know when that there were laws on the books that specifically absolutely yeah discriminated against certain people then it made more sense to be like okay well this there's a law that specifically discriminates against black people or against yeah women. that's almost like if you come out today and say there's you know racism we don't uh, you take the states for example the, the united states is not a racist country like yes racist happens historically it did happen but right now we're living in the best of times and to say that you, our our country our province or uh, the globe is is inherently racist right now i just say well show me how obviously it happens it, but that's the thing if you come out now and say you know what we don't live in a massage you know we don't live in a rape culture what do you mean mm -hmm. then the leftists come out and they're like are you kidding me rape happens all the time and well yeah we get it but we deal with it significantly it's treated here, here's, seriously. Here's the problem. Here's something. Here's here's a thought I had recently. I think that 
I'd be interested in this is some, I might I might tweet this out later to, to if I can phrase it properly. But I'm gonna scoop you. I won't get uh, half <laughs> as much traction though. <laughs> I think the I think a big problem. This is my this is like a new this is like a new thought. I've never okay. heard someone I've never heard someone articulate this. Okay. I think that as societies and laws genuinely become more equal, inclusive, and tolerant. Tolerant, yeah. The necessity for left-wing politics decreases, both socially and politically. Do you see what I mean? So you think it's a work-making excursion for those on the left because they feel like, you know, we're getting better? Well, they, like... If, say if you're a left wing, say if you're like a left wing politician or you're someone who's into this identity, like you need, you need there to be an oppressor and a victim for your whole thing to even work. Right. Do you see what and I mean? And fear. Right. Huh? And fear. Yeah. Well, if, if racism, if, okay, if you, if you literally completely somehow removed all racism and sexism from society overnight, mm-hmm. what would these people do? Right. Do you see what I mean? That's they're, a great they're, point. The whole the whole thing is based on racism, sexism, wrong. homophobia, and other types of bigotry existing so that you can stamp them out. And there's certainly been times, and there still are, there still are many, many countries around the world mm-hmm. where that is still needed. Yes, absolutely. But in the Western world, it's getting harder and harder to genuinely say that we live in like a really discriminatory, racist, homophobic, and, sexist, and whatever. And then we're moved for, to... Jesse society. Smollett, someone, you know, like it's, just, it's a, we live in such a great time that we have to fake yeah, you race have to baiting. Fake like, yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to, you have to pretend stuff, right? People mm-hmm. are making up fake rape cases, fake hate crime cases, mm-hmm. fake, you know, because it's like it needs to, and 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 people almost uh, like one of the funniest things with that whole Je- Jesse Smollett thing was how disappointed people were when they found <laughs> out it wasn't real. I was like, shouldn't you be happy? Shouldn't you be glad? It's the same with Trump didn't... when they found out there was no collusion. They're like, oh, there's just got to be so... <laughs> Isn't it a good thing? <laughs> like, the guy's a dick. He did some crazy things. I would, you know, morally and all that kind of stuff. But when you find out there's no, you know, proof, there's no uh, circumstantial evidence that the leader of, the great, you know, one of the free, freest countries in the world actually didn't do something wrong, and somehow that's a bad thing. And the media was clad. It was so predictable. You could have you could have predicted that. No problem. You say, okay, when this happens, they're going to come out and say yeah but you know yeah. unbelievable yeah it, it was really bizarre like people were literally disappointed that like this well, the, horrible I, racist it, attack didn't it was most noticeable anything. on the media because here the, you would think these people are unbiased and objective oh, and they're totally <laughs> not man and i've been drawn to that and i think that's another plus for me and trump and i am not a trump so you know what i will say this though Last time around, if I had a vote in the States, I would have voted, and Bernie was around, he, Bernie would have been my guy. I'm still a lefty the, on social issues and, and yeah, everything. Sure. But now we've got Ford in Ontario. Ford's a conservative. And he's undoing the last eight or ten years or twelve years of liberal rule that we had that, that was just ideologically possessed. And right. now I'm not a conservative. I'm a Green Party guy. That's as left as you can get. And I've come mm-hmm. around on some of my issues free speech, abortion, capital punishment. I've changed only just recently. So they're kind of like, and I'm not cemented in those views because I don't really know exactly where you draw the line, you know, but I am just so amped to see the pendulum, the political pendulum swing back to take out all that was done on the left. And I don't agree with it. He's cutting social programs. He's making class sizes bigger. He's, you know, they're, oh, they're putting beer in corner stores. Like that should be a priority. But I'm just so excited. (laughs) to see Trump, and I think it's happening more and more all all over the world, conservative governments coming in to undo all the leftist, one of my favorite hashtags, leftist madness. It's madness (laughs) that these people can think that. So I'm cheering them on, even though I'm not a fan and not a voter. But this time around, I'd vote Trump. I seriously would vote Uh, Trump. So would I. I I said that on Twitter and it blew up. Oh, that's, I'm not going to put that. I'm going to edit that out of this podcast. I don't want anyone to know that. But, and and it's not ideologically, it's not ideologically placed. It's not, uh, it's not based in personality. It's just based on, you know what? The left has had their run for a long time and they've done whatever the hell they wanted. And I just, I take great pleasure in watching it being undone. 
That's all. I mean, I mean, I think the truth the truth is, you always want to be somewhere in the middle. I think as as, a, as an entire nation, right? Like people can people will individually have their different views. Ashley St. Clair but... called me a moderate. I finally know what my <laughs> label is now. I'm like, you bitch. I didn't call her that, but like, you moderate? I, I, like, I, I told her I don't know what I am. She said, you're a moderate. I'm like, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I think, like, if society starts going too far right, then I will happily vote to bring it a little bit more left. Right. Yeah. Like, my thing is always just like, you want it somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere in the center, whether that's center or center or center left or center right, honestly, like as far as I'm concerned and as far as it affects my life, I'm like, you know, whatever. I mean, I think one big problem is, I mean, I think it's good, like you touched on earlier, like people are very political now, which is good in a way. But also, I think that like my viewpoint, the reason I've become more libertarian over over time as well is because I just think like uh, the government is not going to solve all the problems no. the, the, and more the laws aren't going to prevent murder or mass you know shootings the, or whatever i mean laws just don't fix that kind of stuff it's yeah, always going to the be there can't legislate yeah. out madness the, yeah the, gov the government has a job and it can do it well but it's up to us as individuals and as families that's why family is important mm -hmm. and as families and communities and societies and towns and villages like from all those different scales to do our best, you know, to maximize our own. That's why I really like Jordan Peterson's overall message. You know, some people criticize him for not trying to mandate some government things and starting with the individual. But it's like that's what that's been my philosophy for a long time. Like, and I think why he's so sorry to interrupt, but I think that's why yeah. he's like people are thirsty for his message now. And I think it's because we really have made it acceptable to just have no personal responsibility. I'm late because of the traffic. I, I'm broke because my boss is an idiot. Like, I mean, just the lack of personal responsibility. And I, I think that's why it's been picked up by young men, mostly. Well, not mostly, but, you know, they always say, you know, YouTube's almost all, like my YouTube yeah, yeah. channel, I have absolutely no female participation <laughs> yeah, so, on it. Like, none. Same, like and this idea that... You know what? It's always somebody else's fault. This is lacking in society, and I think you know he's been a blessing. Is he perfect? No. Does he? Is he provocative? Yes. You know, and he, you know, some of his tweets were just like, oh, jeez. You can just see him. <laughs> you know, he's he's on his computer. He's had had a couple pops. And he's like, I know what I'm gonna do, and yeah, it, it fucking blows up. It's so predictable. But he, yeah, he's uh, people are thirsty for it, and no wonder he's so he's so popular. But you know, it's I think a lot of uh, his detractors are jealous. They're just envious. Oh. They look at this guy and go, "How is this guy making two hundred thousand dollars a year in Patreon? Just monetary, voluntary yeah. donations. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Zui, I really appreciate your time. I don't want to keep you too long, but I do want to. I want to hit you with a couple more things. Um, give me your idea on what you think we need to talk about. Either conversations we're not having that are important." Or conversations mm -hmm. that we're having very badly that need to take place in a in a more positive form where we can hear each other. Like yeah, you know, sure. the civilization rests on these type of conversations. Yeah, sure. Um, most things. I this is the one. Um, I don't know if you saw the interview I did with trigonometry. My answer to this one was abortion. Um, I think that that's something that is fortunately. What's interesting is since I did that video, of course, there's been a lot of conversation generated from some of the laws being. Uh, proposed, proposed in the yeah. U.S. in different states. So that actually, funnily enough, like a couple weeks after I did that interview, it suddenly became this huge public conversation, which I think is good, actually. It's been inching slow, uh, slowly towards the, the public sphere a lot lately since yeah. Trump was elected, I think, because people yeah. were worried about it. Yeah, in the UK, in the UK, it's not. It's not a public conversation in the UK. You know what they're I trying to do in Canada now? Our Liberal government, our left wing, you know Trudeau. I, I know mm -hmm. you're familiar with. This is what mm -hmm. they're trying to do. They're trying to make abortion in Canada has no law on abortion. I can't even it believe has no it. limit. It, no, no law at all. There's no regulation yeah. or law on it at all. And this yes. is what the left wing government is trying to do as an election issue is bring it in. Be, you know because that's politi politically motivated. So just an aside, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one conversation. The debate that's be the conversation that's being had, from what I can see online, is it's uh, people are talking like that. Yeah, past the, each other. The, yeah, and it's and people are being extremely dishonest, like stupidly dishonest, and just and the extreme arguments on both sides are as ridiculous as each other's is. It's just absolutely hypocrisy. 
Yeah, completely ascientific, and it's just um, so. I think that's something that's 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 one of the few issues that I'm quite. Yeah, well, not quite. I'm I'm very I have extremely strong. I have very very strong views on. Um, no, is this and, something um, you changed? Were you pro I did choice? change. Yes, yeah. I used to be. I used to not think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went from not thinking about it, which I guess made me pro choice by default, right? Just because that's the law. And then when I really thought about it, um, it didn't take very long for me to become like pretty hard line pro life. Um, just because, again, I listened to both sides of the arguments and I couldn't myself maintain my position very well in mm -hmm. any way that was real, either m like that was both moral and rational. Mm hmm. And if I hold a position which I cannot morally nor rationally defend, then I need to change my position. Mm, I gotcha. just think the pro the, the pro life position is a lot better, to put it simply, um, a lot more ethical, a lot more moral, a lot more consistent, less you know? hypocr uh, hypocritical. Yeah, yeah, it's not hypocritical, you know, because mm. um, there are so many holes in. I mean, I've come across like two good pro choice arguments, like ever. Um, that actually were like, you know, made me like probably like think and mull things like 80, like 90% of the ones you see thrown around online are just terrible. They're just mantras and slogans, or they're just completely, completely ascientific that doesn't just, you just say, Oh, it's, it's not a baby. It's a clump of cells. And someone's talking about like a six month old. You're just like, dude, like, have you ever seen a scan? Have you ever seen, I don't know if you have any children or nieces or nephews or you've seen, you know, it's like, come on, man, this is a human being. Like you can't just deny that based on feelings like it's silly um so yeah that's one conversation and then uh something like less heavy but um just i think that a lot of these conversations i just think um people need to understand the other side better like one i was hoping that with trump getting elected and brexit happening in the uk and the rise of nationalism in the europe i thought I would have hoped that people, especially people are, you know, more left leaning people would try to understand what's actually going on rather than just like pointing at people and screaming racism, xenophobia, hatred, cruel, like just screaming stuff. Right. And this is what's happening right now. Trump has just landed in the UK today and people are just screaming stupid terms and tweeting stupid stuff like, you know, the mayor of London. Like, I'm like, look. Mayor, like, City Khan's not going to hear this podcast. Like, why doesn't the mayor of London, like, if he's got all this beef with Trump, why doesn't, like, I can't meet with Trump. I can't organize a, like, he's the mayor of London. Organize a meeting, like, meet him, talk. Do you see what, like, it annoys me. He's like, it's like, he'll go on Twitter and say, like, oh, blah, blah. He'll say bad stuff about him on Twitter and he'll write, he'll hide, he'll go on TV and say, and then when he's face to face to him, he's say, zipped. It's like, dude, man up, yeah, like go yeah, and yeah. talk to him. If you've got do you, like, why don't you guys talk? If you've got like, if there's a particular issue, which you think he's that wrong on mm -hmm. or that he's, you know, misrepresenting, like just talk, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, um, it, it, it's, it's so obvious to me, right? It's so obvious to me. And, and this goes across all the things. Like if you're a, if you're a, Republican and you think like Democrats are just insane, like go talk to them. Mm. If you're a Democrat and you think all the Trump voters are insane, like talk to them. Find out why oh why did you vote Trump? Rather think, than going, oh you rather than going, oh, everyone who voted Trump is racist, mm -hmm. which is a pretty damning and divisive thing to say, mm -hmm. why don't you go, hmm, that's not what I expected. Let me let me oh you know what? Like ten of my friends who like I like and who I know are good people voted for Trump. Why don't I talk to them and find out why? Rather than just going, oh, no, they voted for Trump, so they're no longer my friends and like Xing people out and doing all this canceling bull crap. It's like, why don't you talk to people? Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, you know, what I mean, like in the UK, I mean, it's, it's not quite as polarized. But of course, you've got the big thing is Brexit with the remain and leave. And you've got people who voted remain who were then like, oh, everybody, everybody who voted leave is just racist and they hate immigrants and all this. And you're just like, dude. There are completely valid reasons why people would vote remain and there's completely valid reasons why people would vote leave, which have nothing to do with being racist or hating immigrants. And I mean, if you think that the country is that bad, then I kind of feel sorry for you to begin with. But why don't you just talk to each other and then you can have the debate and you can share ideas. And that person who voted leave might think, oh, you know, I guess that's a you've got a fair point there and you might do the same thing. And 
at least you'll even if you just don't agree, you've had the discussion and you you'll go away more informed. You'll have a better understanding of the other position. I mean, I'd like to think on any big issue down to the fundamental things like believing in God, like I think I could argue from an atheist perspective very, very yeah, well. Sure. Like I, I could pretend to be an atheist. Yeah, you could still man the argument. Yeah. I could like completely convince somebody that I'm an atheist because yeah. <laughs> I know I understand the perspective. And I, I get the perspective. Like I think it I think it makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. I think right, I it's it's not even that I think it's like a complete it's like no, I, I get it. Like yeah. I can understand why you would not believe in God, mm-hmm. just as much as I can understand why I and other people believe do believe in, in yeah. God. It's mm-hmm. not like, okay, this one makes sense and the other one's completely bonkers. It's like, no, I, I get both positions. I understand the pro-choice position. I don't agree with it, but I can under, I understand it. I just think that it's generally based on not looking at the full picture. I think the, pro, the pro-choice argument hinges very largely on ignoring what is being done to the, the fetus or baby and just completely focusing on framing it as a women's rights issue rather than a human's rights issue. Mm. And I think that's kind of like very selective framing, whereas I think the pro-life position is looking at the whole picture and like, okay, what's actually going on when an abortion happens? And let's not let's not ignore that there is a life or at least, a depending on the stage, a, a potential life, human life that is being taken here, mm-hmm. which, is the, which is the honest, honest position. And like, yes, there is, of course, women are the ones who get pregnant women it's women who carry children. so yes there is there is that perspective but there's also another one so when people are just my body my choice my body my choice no uterus no opinion you're like what about the baby Mm -hmm. right it's not a baby it's a clump of cells and you're like well no that's not true and it's just such a hard it's such a hard-headed annoying position because it's like okay can we have an honest conversation here Mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah um so yeah that's a that was a long-winded answer. Zuby uh, right. music. <laughs> appreciate your, your your time, brother. And I, I'm gonna keep you just for a few minutes longer. And then uh, uh, again, thank you so much for your time. So, what would you say that your underlying commitment is? Uh, again, uh, you know, I acknowledged you're a little provo- uh, provocative, um, and then we can talk about your tweet in the gym the other day, um, because I think your underlying commitment is much different than how it comes off. You know, you it's it comes off as clickbait, right? So, <laughs> oh, I don't, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't do clickbait. Never. <laughs> um, I provoke. I don't do clickbait. Okay. No, click, click, clickbait is deceiving people. Oh, okay. Right? I got you. All right. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. thanks for the clickbait. Clickbait would be like putting up this interview and saying like, oh, right. Oh, YouTube okay. title putting. Zuby gets naked. <laughs> video, right? Zuby doesn't get naked. Right. That would be, that would be clickbait. Okay. Um, gotcha. If you just put like a provocative title that's true. Then all right, all right. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's all good. Um, what was uh, oh underlying commitment to have a positive impact on over ten million people? That's everything that you do. All it underlies when you're working out in the gym, when you're practicing your faith, when you're loving your girlfriend, whatever. Yeah, my my my, my lifetime goal making a difference, to positive have a positive impact. Yeah, not just a difference, a, a large scale large scale difference. I want to do that through my music, through my voice, my speaking, my conversations, through my knowledge, anything that I, any gifts I have that I can provide to the world and maximize, I want to do that. So, um, online, offline, public speaking, touring, coaching, online video, podcasts, interviews. I want it all to be things that, you know, I hope people will listen to this and cool. That's another X number of people who I've had a positive impact on. And that could be in different ways. That could be making them think a little differently. That could be saying something motivational that helps them in their lives somehow. That could be just hearing my story and thinking, oh, that guy's done something. I can I can do the same. So that's really what my North Star is. Awesome. Well, I want I want your body, but I don't want to work for it. I don't want I don't want to pay for it in any particular way. I don't want to have to wake up early. I don't want to have to go to the gym every day. But dude, you got something rolling there. Speaking of which, tell me about the deadlift, man. Where, where did that come from, and how is that motivated, and how has that changed your life, if any? Um, no, it certainly changed my life, man. Yeah, um, it's brought me to the awareness of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, more people. Um, First of all, just for so, people that don't know what happened, tell us, tell us what you okay, did. Okay, so on the, I think it was the 26th of February, 
I tweeted a short video of me doing a 230 kg deadlift in the gym, um, which is well below my maximum I want to have. <laughs> 15 kilos above the British women's deadlift record in my weight class. Um, so I posted this tweet and I said in the tweet that um, I keep hearing about how biological men don't have any strength advantage over women in 2019. So watch me destroy the British women's deadlift record without trying. And then I wrote, P.S. I identified as a woman while lifting the weight, so don't be a bigot. And it went super viral. The video's now got well over one and a half million views on the original tweet. Bad, um, it was covered by like all, most new most news organizations covered it, um, apart from the ones who have an ideological slant against someone uh, exposing that. So, which, which was which is also interesting. Those who chose to cover it and those who didn't. Um, and yeah, it blew up. I gained. At the time I tweeted it, I had 19,000 followers. I've now got 63,000. Um, I wish about 20, about 20,000 came in the within the next like sort of 20 days of it, um, and it's just raised my profile very, very significantly. What's been great is so many people have discovered my music and my podcast and my writing and other works humor. through that thing. Yeah, that that was kind of the gateway. <laughs> I think the timing was good because. It wasn't like I was just some random person who POTUS posted this thing and so people saw it and then disappeared really quickly. People saw it and then were like, oh, this guy's actually interesting. Oh, cool. He's, oh, he's a good rapper. Oh, he does podcasts. Oh, he's at his Twitter feed. He's really interesting. So people kind of came for the deadlift and then stayed for the conversation and for the music and for everything else. So it's been a uh, – yeah, it's it's been really valuable in terms of raising my profile and my followers and – putting me on the radar of a lot of big people like, you know, Joe Rogan now follows me on Twitter. I mean, most of the, most of the so-called intellectual dark web follows me on Twitter, um, with a handful of exceptions. Um, so that's been really positive. I'm looking to get out to the States hopefully in September Nice. and some stuff in the U S and, uh, yeah, it's all, uh, it's, it's been a weird thing for that to be one of the catalysts, one of the biggest catalysts for my career considering how hard i've been plugging away for the past 12 years yeah and that's uh, kind of like a bonus of your your hard work so how does that how do you resolve that with your underlying commitment of making a positive difference for everyone that's a good one um well a bigger platform and a bigger mm -hmm. audience all feeds into that so right. when people are like oh why do you want to raise your profile or why do you want to be it's like because then i've got more influence and more impact if I've got 100,000 followers, I've got even more impact. If I've got a million followers, I've got even more impact. And so I want to do good in the world. You know what I mean? Uh, that's been my goal since I started making music. If, literally, I think the first rap I ever wrote, which I don't have access to now, but it was basically about how I want to have a positive impact on the world and how I'm not just doing what I do for my own selfish reasons. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the main reasons I became an artist and I went into it full time. It was, you know, it certainly wasn't for financial gain because I was making a lot more money doing the corporate stuff. But um, it's because I know I knew I couldn't have a huge impact on that previous trajectory. Mm -hmm. On the trajectory I'm on now, I have the potential to make to impact this many people. Um, whereas before, it's like, okay, cool. I'll be and I'll enrich myself and maybe help a couple people here and there. But I wouldn't have just had the platform and the voice and the and the public profile to make a big change. And I think that there are a lot of people who have a really big public profile or who are super famous or super wealthy or whatever. And they're not, I guess everyone thinks they're using their platform for good, but I think a lot of people aren't really using their platform in the way that it could be used. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some people are, and some in ways I agree with some in ways I disagree with, I guess they think they're doing good regardless. But, um, that's why I th that's why I think it's important, and that, like I said, that's why I'm so outspoken. Because it's like, well, you're gonna have somebody on Twitter who's got a million followers who are telling you like that. I don't know, um, men are bad, yep. <laughs> right? Men are bad, especially white men. Someone with <laughs> one million followers will tweet that. So you need somebody else with a million followers to be like, nah, this is bullcrap, and here's why. The balance and then you can then you can let the balance of then you can let the battle of ideas take place, mm -hmm. and I can tell you which of those ideas is stronger. So, you know, I think it's uh, it's important to have people of, you know, straight, straight thinkers, straight talkers, real talkers. And there's there seems to be a very healthy appetite for that. I think that my Twitter growth and my growth on other platforms, I had so many messages and comments, whether even from people who disagree with me, who were just like, dude, like, 
your authenticity is refreshing. Like I don't mm-hmm. agree with you on everything, but I love the fact that you just you, know, you don't back down. You just say. And I will second true. that. And your integrity is important to a guy like me, who's when he's running ten minutes late, says, "Hey, bro, I'm running ten minutes late." It's <laughs> so right. simple to not leave a guy waiting. And you know, I can't tell you how many people roll up and are like, "I'm late for everything." Well, not with me. You're not because it, that's, there's no integrity in that. So when you shot me that message just before the interview was supposed to start, and like, man, I'm running a few minutes late. I'm like, thanks, I appreciate that integrity. Period. I was, I, mean? I was raised well, man. I was, yeah. Honestly, honestly, I got my parents are freaking amazing. Mm. My parents are phenomenal. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll big up my parents. Like they are, they've done a phenomenal job. Like as I, the, the older I get, the more I respect them. I like, agree, and I appreciate them well uh, as well. <laughs> and there's more people like me that are coming along, brother. We didn't even talk about the book. What's the book about, and how can people get it? Absolutely. So um, the book is called Strong Advice, Zuby's Guide to Fitness for Everybody. So mm. it's an ebook. It's very concise, but very thorough. It teaches you everything you need to know about how you need to eat and how you need to train, whether your goal is to build muscle, burn fat, um, get in better shape, improve your physique, all those things. If Whether you're a beginner or you've been training for a while, it's, um, yeah, it's, I just wanted to write a no-nonsense guide to basically distill the most important stuff I've learned over the past 16 years, much of it through reading and learning, much of it through trial and error of what works, what doesn't work, what matters, what doesn't matter. So that if you wanted to go in the gym and you're like, okay, cool, I want to get stronger and lose 20 pounds, this is how you do it. This is exactly how many calories you need to eat, how to calculate it for your own body. This is uh, These are the most effective exercises that you can do that will give you the best time for your buck. This is our best bang for your buck in terms of time trade off in the gym. And uh, this is, yeah, and then dispelling a lot of rumors about, you know, people worry about, oh, it's 8 p.m. Can I eat carbohydrates? Oh, yeah. it's, can I, is it okay to eat fruit? Oh, can I do this? And it's like, look, it just dispels all the rumors and cool. puts it down real, real plain. If you like the way I tweet, you'll love the book because it's written in the same way I tweet. That's very frank and honest and no BS. If you want to check it out, um, the link is in my Twitter bio. My Twitter is at Zuby Music. You can also get the book directly at teamzuby.com, T-E-A-M-Z-U-B-Y. Now, dude, you're an outlier. You don't smoke. smoke. You don't drink. <laughs> your, your rap is all positive. You don't have any yeah. tats. I mean, dude, this, you're breaking the mold, and you're successful, even better, uh, trying to make a positive difference with, with your rap, uh, something I, I really appreciate, brother. So you come off as a guy that's got his shit together that's um, very disciplined. If, if I could just say how you occur for me, a guy that you know, is talking to you for the first time, um, even though we're looking through a screen here, I feel like when you look at me, you're actually looking at my eyes. You care enough <laughs> to make eye contact. Uh, so if anything, uh, I, w- I want to know, one, how do you stay accountable? And who do you, do you have coaches that you stay accountable to? And what do you struggle with? Like, what is your, like, I mean, I, I look at a guy like you and I'm like, oh, man, if I, like, I have several addictions that I've tried to break. Some I've been successful at dropping completely. Some are mm-hmm. still haunting me. Some come up and, and, and sneak up on me and grab me once in a while. But I know what it's like when I'm like standing in front of my vice. I'm like, okay, I'll just start again tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And then I'm weak. I wonder what keeps you strong and what you struggle with and how you stay accountable. When you come up against wow. it, when you're really struggling, you're like, okay, I can have this donut or I can stay yeah. on my goal. You got to have a higher purpose, I guess, that drives you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll say number one is just I think I'm fortunate in terms of my personality type. Okay. As in, I am, I am, and have always been very. I'm not easily influenced. You're high on conscientiousness, then. Extremely high on conscientiousness. Extremely low in neuroticism. Okay. So I'm not emotional. I'm very unemotional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for better or for worse. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like two, like I got two on neuroticism out of 100. Yeah, like two. I, me too. So yeah, so so it means I'm, I'm not prone to anxiety or depression or any kind of mental health problems or issues or addictions or anything like that, that's, which is fortunate. Yeah. And I'm very, and that's naturally, biological. I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm naturally disciplined. So if I'm not doing something productive, I feel bad. Mm. Right. So I don't, I don't have a TV in this house. I don't have a, I've got like a projector. I've got an Xbox. I haven't turned it on this year because I'm playing video games. I'm like, man, no, there's something else I could be doing that's more productive. Uh-huh. So yeah. I'm, I'm naturally wired like that. So okay. some of it isn't necessarily me doing anything. 
I'm just, I've been like that since I was a child. Like my parents will vouch like, yeah, I've just been like that. Just born that way. Um, and then in terms of outside stuff, I would say certainly my faith helps. So if I'm struggling with something or I'm just, I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm very, I'm a very grateful person. Um, I can be a little bit cynical and cautious just mm-hmm. because of the way the world is. So yeah. there's some things that, you know, I can be a little bit critical of the world sometimes and whatnot, but I'm extremely grateful. I, and I have a good sense of perspective having grown up in across three different countries and cultures and sort of seen traveled to over 30 countries. I've seen a lot of the world and I've seen true hardship. I've seen true poverty. No, I haven't lived through it and I'm grateful I haven't lived through it, Amen. but I've seen, but I've seen what it looks like. And it's just given me this lens and perspective on the world where I'm like, you know, there's so many thousands of things I can be grateful for. So I try not to complain. I've got really great friends. I've got a fantastic family. I've got, I've got I come from a big family. You know, I've got two, four siblings, I've got nine nieces and nephews. My parents are wonderful. They're still together. I was hanging out with them this weekend. Awesome. So yeah, you know, so I've got a really, really tight family, um, great friends and yeah. And then I guess I try to be, um, I think just being, again, just trying to be authentic helps just kind of putting my, it's cathartic for me. And oh, I'll tell you another one is, is fitness, fitness, being in, being in shape, going to the gym. That's like my, that's been like a ritual for me for like 15 years, you know, just that's the one place where I don't think about anything else. I just go in there. I train. It's something that I can constantly, constantly be working on. And I think that really does help to ground me a lot. I find if I, if I take like four or five days off the gym, I start getting like quite edgy and I, I kind of lose my it starts to work like on a, your mind. Eh? Yeah. I feel mm-hmm. like I'm permanently hungry. That's what it's like. Like I, I become my, my temper becomes a little, like I've, I've got a super long temper, but I become a little more snappy and mm. a bit more moody and stuff like that. Interesting. So yeah, I think for me it's that it's, um, partially personality and then just, um, having a big goal, uh, my personal faith, having great family, great friends, trying to be authentic, trying to improve myself and all those things combined just, yeah, they help me just kind of stay on the. Stay on the straight and narrow, I guess you could say. My brother, I love you, man. I appreciate your time. It's uh, It's been nothing but positivity. Uh, I've learned a little bit uh, watching your feed. And uh, I think it's cool that you still make time for the little guys. Uh, I got CC Bucko coming on next week. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, CC's <laughs> yeah. cool, man. Robin, uh, I've been following her for a, a long time. Uh, I love her take, too, and the strength of a yeah. strong woman to have a conservative <laughs> take or any of her takes and just yeah. stand be- behind it. I- I'm really looking forward to talking to her too. So uh, I look forward to getting uh, down with a little bit more of your content, especially Gad Sad, uh, just on the way out. Tell me about Gad, the Gad father. Isn't he yeah, the most a, beautiful he's a, man? He's a, he's a, <laughs> that's my that's my beautiful sister of color right now. Yeah. <laughs> sister yeah, of color, I did see that tweet. <laughs> stand in solidarity yeah man oh, i appreciate uh everything you're doing and uh, much success to you much love from across Thank the pond you. and uh bro if you ever find yourself in niagara falls or even in the toronto area i'm only an hour yeah. outside of toronto love to awesome. hang with you man it'd be awesome to put no, my no, arms no, around I'll, you i'll be, be there good. at some point i've been before so i'll come again all right zuby appreciate the time man thank you very much appreciate good luck you. have a good one bro. All right, man. Take care. peace <laughs> now can i figure out how to turn this thing off Zub? Don't spell my name wrong. All right, brother. We'll talk soon. Peace. Take care, man. That was Zuby. If you need him, add Zuby Music on Twitter. Check him out.